come on. Everybody knows this one by now. And spoilers for the following Scooby-Doo episodes. While on the way to visit a cattle ranch owned by yet another one of Daphne's uncles, the gang are waylaid by a giant flying ghost bull, which they later learn may be the legendary Tamuka, a spirit worshipped by an ancient tribe of Native American cliff dwellers that once lived in the area. Daphne's uncle, Matt Blake, owned the Lazy S Ranch, which had recently been experiencing an unexplained loss of cattle. It really shook us up, Uncle Matt. Uh-huh. A flying bull? Were they trying to slip in an adult joke with the name of the ranch? Using an S was necessary for a later plot point, but I can't help but think at least one writer is laughing at how clever he was. This is yet another episode featuring an uncle experiencing supernatural shenanigans, which makes me wonder if the families of all the members of the Scooby gang are under some sort of curse. You'll notice few if any of the uncles in the scooby doo universe are married. Is it possible Fred and the rest can afford to drive all over the country solving mysteries for free because they're living off of the inheritances of all the uncles who died before the teenagers could arrive in time to save them? I don't know, Matt. Twenty cows vanished from our ranch without a trace. Allegedly, Blake's ranch wasn't the only one with missing animals, as his neighbor, Sam Farron, also complained about losing several head of cattle from his double O ranch. Little did Blake know that Farron himself was responsible for the thefts. Cattle rustling. The crime this time was cattle rustling, something we've already seen before in previous Scoopy episodes, so right off the bat, the design takes a hit when it comes to originality. Perhaps the villain makes up for it with his hideout. Nope. Perhaps the villain makes up for it with his disguise. Nope. The medicine man! He's going into the burial mound! They may refer to the ghost as a medicine man, but that's pretty much the exact same character model of the witch doctor from Decoy from a Dog Napper. Also the same episode where we first saw the bad guys using an abandoned cliff dweller village as their hideout. If you're keeping track at home, this is now the fourth time a witch doctor has appeared in the Scooby-Doo universe. I do not understand Hanna-Barbera's obsession with these guys. They even managed to slip one into a Johnny Quest episode a decade earlier. In addition to Farron, the two other bad guys revealed in the episode were Farron's unnamed foreman, who I think looks like Lyle from Blazing Saddles, and Lenny, who worked as the cook on Blake's ranch. In an earlier video, I explained that large-scale cattle rustling wasn't that common in the modern era, and most theft either involved one or two animals taken at night and immediately sold at an auction, or a wandering cow might be taken in by a neighboring ranch and kept until it bred a few calves, then released back to the original owner's land. Stealing entire herds fell out of practice, due in large part to how much harder it was to hide them, what with the advent of better ways of finding lost animals, including air searches using a small plane or helicopter. Helicopter. And that's how they did it. They branded the double O over the lazy S, leaving no trace. Farron got around this through the rather ingenious, though admittedly cruel, method of overriding the brand on Blake's cattle with the one from his own ranch. This does make me wonder if Farron deliberately chose the name of his ranch because his brand looked close enough to Blake's, or if the brand similarity was just a coincidence he took advantage of. We don't know how long each ranch had been in business, or even which came first. However, the branding similarity seemed a little too dubiously convenient. To me, it seems likely that Farron's ranch had been established after Blake's, and the cattle rustler chose his branding in anticipation of stealing from his neighbor at some point. It's even possible that Farron had been stealing cattle from Blake for years, but had kept it under the radar with just one or two animals at a time, so as not to raise too much suspicion. However, even massive livestock operations with thousands of steers takes the disappearance of even one or two seriously enough to take steps to prevent further loss. Thus, it's unlikely Farron could have been taking Blake's cattle for very long. Without knowing any of the extenuating circumstances for Farron's motivation to resort to cattle rustling, 
we'll just have to chalk it up to simple human greed. However, exactly how justified was that greed? Steers raised for meat typically weigh between 1,000 to 1,500 pounds prior to market. In 1976, the average sales price per hundred weight was between $25 and $37. Thus, the smallest head of cattle with the lowest price would be worth $250, while the heaviest, at the most expensive rate, would be worth a little over $550. When accounting for inflation, this would be between $1,400 to $3,000 per animal in today's money. We don't know how much livestock was taken. The only time a number is used is when Farron claimed he lost 20 animals on his ranch. Obviously, as the villain, he was lying, but for the sake of argument, let's use that number as a benchmark. 20 cattle would account for anywhere between $5,000 and $11,000, or $28,000 to $60,000 in today's money. That is not enough to make this a worthwhile scheme. That monster is my ranch foreman. Mr. Blake, it's happened again. The cows in the south pasture, they're gone. We have no way of determining the size of Blake's ranch or the number of livestock on it. He's clearly not running a massive industrial operation with tens of thousands of cattle, but it also looks larger than a mere family-owned ranch, especially as he's employing a full-time cook. Although we never see any other farmhands other than his foreman. An average medium-sized ranch in Texas could easily be around 500 acres, and it's not unreasonable to assume 500 animals for that amount of land. It would be far fewer cattle than that if we were talking about a grazing ranch with grassland, but Blake's ranch is set in an arid, desert environment which allows for more animals per acre since the rancher is not relying on the ground itself to provide food for his stock. Blake's foreman said the cows in the south pasture were gone. From this, we can infer the ranch was divided into cardinal directions, either four sections, north, east, south, and west, or two sections with just a north and south pasture. If the former and 500 animals were distributed evenly, that would leave a bit over 100 animals per pasture, making the value of the missing animals anywhere from $30,000 to $70,000, or $175,000 to $375,000 in today's money. Double those figures at the latter layout, making the scheme possibly worth close to $750,000 in today's money. As the foreman said again, we can infer even more steers were stolen than just what may have been in the south pasture, pushing the value of the stolen animals to close to a million dollars. This is all speculation, and if any of my assumptions are wrong, the value of the scheme could be way off. However, I feel reasonably secure in stating Ferenc plot comfortably falls between $60,000 to $1 million in today's money. Obviously, the low end is not worth the hassle, but was even a million dollars worth it for the corrupt cattleman? This potential million dollars does not account for the expenses incurred by Farron in executing his scheme. First, there was the custom-built helicopter. Helicopter plus paying for the services of his foreman and Blake's treasonous cook. You can't say that he was already paying his foreman a salary and this was just another duty. We're talking criminal activity, and that's well above the typical job description for a ranch hand. Farron would have had to pay his henchmen enough to not only make it worth their while to risk prison, but also enough to hopefully prevent the possibility of future blackmail should either of the two men decide they wanted another payday. It would also go a long way toward explaining Farron's motivation if we knew how big his own ranch was. After all, the smaller his operation, the more valuable a million dollars would be. The fact that Farron seems comfortable standing with Blake means his ranch is likely around the same size. If Farron's ranch was massive, why would he be hanging out with a penny ante farmer like Blake? Consequently, if Farron's ranch was tiny, it would be odd for him to be so chummy with the more successful rancher. From this, I'm comfortable assuming that, at best, a million dollars may account for only a few seasons of Farron's operation. It would have made more sense if Blake's ranch had a special breed of steer, one that was bigger or the meat was better, thus providing more of a reason for Farron to steal them. 
Of course, this would make hiding the stolen cattle much more difficult, even with the branding ruse, because it would be obvious that the special cattle had come from Blake's pasture if any were seen roaming Farron's grounds. Hell, if they just introduced a rivalry between the two ranchers, it would have made the scheme make more sense. But on the surface, both men seemed cordial with each other. In the end, a million dollars is nothing to sneeze at. Speaking of which, whatever happened to Shaggy's allergy to hay? Hey! Hey, this is hay! Achoo! Many of us might be hard-pressed not to succumb to temptation for that much money. But for Farron, what was more than likely just a mere two or three years of normal income should not have been that much of a motivation for him to risk his own ranch and freedom by cattle rustling. I'm giving his design a 2.5 out of 5. It wasn't original, and the dollar amount wasn't worth it. But his method for hiding the stolen animals was clever, and did prove effective. Another goddamned witch doctor. Though this time it was the henchman dressed up as one, leaving the mastermind of the scheme with the only other disguise featured in the episode. A cow outfit. This is weird, right? That costume could not have been comfortable, and many would find it a bit humiliating as well. So you'd think the guy calling the shots would have made an underling wear it instead of himself. You think that's weird? Look! Someone's following us. Scare him away. I wonder if the writers chose to have Farron inside that costume because it'd be more amusing to see a cow giving orders to the witch doctor rather than the other way around. Speaking of the cow outfit, only Farron was shown to be inside it, despite the costume traditionally needing two operators, as seen by Shaggy and Scooby wearing one themselves. Was there another henchman hiding in the rear that we never saw? The only other character introduced in the episode was Carl, Blake's foreman. I'll ride into town and let the sheriff know what's going on. I'll go with Carl. I don't want to say that Carl was yet another unrevealed villain like Sally from my last video, but it's interesting that he drove the Jeep with Farron and Lenny to go notify the sheriff and was never seen again. Farron later kidnapped Blake, presumably to keep him from contacting the authorities, but what happened to Carl? He didn't show up in the reveal at the end, and there was no mention of him having been kidnapped. Ah, I heard cowboys, but I didn't see any. Furthermore, during the stampede scene later, two distinct voices are heard yelling at the moving cattle. Fred even says he can hear cowboys, plural. The first voice is obviously played by Casey Kasem, who also did Sam Farron, while the second sounds like Frank Welker, who played Carl. If Carl was guilty, he's in that horse costume. If he was innocent, he might be buried in a shallow grave somewhere in the cold desert night. I prefer to think he's in the back half of Farron's outfit, and the writers just forgot to include him in the unmasking. Poor Carl. Is there anything more humiliating than being forced to cram yourself in the back of a sweaty cow disguise and having your nose inches away from your boss's behind for hours at a time? Eh, I guess there is. The scooby doo universe really seems to have it out for guys named Carl. F*** Carl the Stuntman. Jesus Christ! This is cultural appropriation on steroids, washed down with a six-pack of Monster Energy drink. As for the outfits themselves, obviously neither get any credit for originality. This is the fourth witch doctor, and the second time this exact same character model is used. And by now my viewers should know just how much I appreciate cultural appropriation. The cow outfit is also generic as hell, though probably made from actual cow parts and not simply sewn together in a factory. Like most disguises based on costumes derived from a tribal culture, the witch doctor is only as scary as the victim's own background would allow while the cow disguise is meant for camouflage and not for its fear factor. 
it should come as no surprise that Theron and his henchmen get a one out of five for their disguises. The episode begins with the gang being terrorized by Tamuka, a giant flying ghost bull, which is later determined to be just a modified helicopter. Helicopter. What was the point of this attack, though? Traditionally, in a Scooby episode, the monster in question is usually employed by the villain to scare off intruders. But that's not the case this time around. Hey. Like what happened, Freddy? In the sky! Creeper! A flying bull! This is as good a time as any to point out that nobody's wearing seatbelts. I wonder how many times the mystery machine has had to have its windshield replaced after members of the gang blasted through it when the vehicle came to an abrupt stop. The Mooka? The flying bull you think you saw. A thousand years ago, a tribe of cliff dwellers lived in Hidden Valley. According to the legend, their burial ground was guarded by the spirit of a flying bull. A tribe of Native American cliff dwellers had a giant flying bull guard their graveyard for the last thousand years? That's a neat trick since cattle wasn't introduced to the Americas until 500 years ago. Mr. Blake, what we saw was no legend. It was real. It's all in your mind. Because of the legend, you imagined you saw it. Gaslighting apparently runs in the gang's families. In Farron's cattle rustling scheme, Tamuka is not meant to drive away Blake or visitors to his ranch. In fact, if Blake were to shut down operation, Farron would lose his source of stolen livestock. Tamuka's sole purpose is to be seen by as many people as possible to divert attention away from the more human reason behind the theft. Which then begs the question, why Blake refused to accept the gang's story about having been chased by the giant flying ghost bull? As the owner of the stolen cattle, Blake is the one who Farron really needed to have seen Tamuka. The fact that this far into the crime, the victim still hasn't seen the monster himself means Farron really dropped the ball on a significant portion of his scheme. And that's right, Mr. Blake. Scooby and me, we're terrific detectives. I like there's no mystery we can't solve. Right, Scoob? Right. Wrong. Did this failure drive Farron to kidnap Blake? If so, it was a mistake for a couple of reasons. First, Kidnapping can only increase the attention from law enforcement, possibly even the FBI, whereas stolen cattle would get a shrug from the local cops. They would give a cursory examination to the crime scene and write up a report for insurance purposes, but unless they caught the bad guys in the act, there wasn't much they could do. Second, what was the plan for after the kidnapping? Farron's plot wasn't to steal all of Blake's cattle, but rather seemed to be merely increasing his own inventory by stealing from his neighbors. If Blake's ranch shut down, where would that leave Farron's scheme? This is why parasites generally don't kill their hosts. <coughs> Scooby-Doo, where are you? I <coughs> I wasn't kidding when I said nobody wears seatbelts. Why did Farron even resort to kidnapping? Did he have no faith in his branding gimmick? Logically, the only way he would have been found out was if someone had access to his bookkeeping who then counted the livestock on his ranch and determined he had a lot more than he was supposed to. This would require a warrant from investigators who had to have probable cause that Farron might have been cattle rustling. Creepers! A flying bull! You mean a flying ghost bull? Ghost bull? Yes! As for the flying bull prop itself, it very clearly changes design from the beginning of the episode to the end when it's exposed as a helicopter. Helicopter. I'm willing to ignore this as artistic license on the part of the animators. The bladeless bull seen at the beginning is likely meant to portray how the vehicle looked to the gang as it pursued them, versus the end when they were more clear-headed and could see it for what it really was. However, that doesn't explain away the sound of the vehicle. It takes a lot of power for a mechanical device to achieve lift, which is why they're usually so noisy. 
Yet the first time the gang encountered Tamuka, not only is the sound of the rotors missing that would have made it obvious it was a helicopter, Helicopter. But the only thing they do hear is galloping and the roar of the bull. As always, this could be explained by having the first appearance of Tamuka be achieved using a movie projector and loudspeakers. But if that was the case, why would Farron have needed what was likely an extremely expensive modified flying machine? This is, of course, setting aside the lack of any mention of a projector or loudspeaker at the end of the episode. Kudos, though, for being able to somehow nab Blake from a moving jeep inside a tunnel. How in the hell did that happen? This is never explained. No trick tunnel, no stopping inside, no hidden passages. If it had happened outside the tunnel, it could have been explained as a henchman having snared Blake with a rope or a hook dangling from Tamuka. As seen in the episode, the way Blake was kidnapped should not have been physically possible. More cartoon physics, I suppose. This is very mysterious. Why would a ghost open a fence with wire cutters? This was a dumb thing for the villains to have done. If the whole point of the scheme was to blame the legendary Tamuka for the missing cattle, why leave such obvious physical evidence of the theft? Seasoned ranchers like Farron and his henchmen should have been able to replace the wire on the fence to avoid scrutiny. Granted, if someone looked hard enough, it might be obvious that the wire had been recently replaced, but it would have at least stood up to a cursory examination. Quick! Into the mystery machine! Wait! Help me! I, I can't move! Tamuka's got me! Why didn't Daphne's blouse tear? What's it made of? Kevlar? Although that would explain why she didn't get burned by the demon in the previous episode. Look, is this what you wanted to see? Someone's coming! Let's get out of here! <laughs> what are you doing here snooping around these cows? How did Daphne and Fred get trapped in the rope too? <gasps> what happened? I heard you scream! Scream? <gasps> <gasps> you know, the Scooby Gang respects Native American reigns almost as much as an after-school club at Yale University. I also question the need for Farron to use the abandoned Cliff Dweller Village as a hideout. He already had a ranch that could house the stolen cattle which were rebranded to hide in plain sight, and he had a modified burial mound to hide the helicopter. Helicopter. Everything else they left inside the village was just additional physical evidence that could be used against them should the authorities stumble onto their scheme. This way! In here! Velma is strong enough to routinely carry the other four members of the gang on her back, but she needed Daphne's help getting up the ladder? Or was Velma just taking advantage of the situation to get to hold Daphne's hand? Look, last time we were here, those shields were against the wall. They're just thousand-year-old relics. Just toss them anywhere. If anything, Farron and his henchmen were needlessly adding to the list of felonies they would face should they get caught. Or maybe not. Federal protection of Native American grave sites didn't really kick in until almost 15 years after this episode aired. And at the time, Texas didn't seem to be doing much to protect the cultural heritage of the tribes inside the state it's more than likely that no one would even think of charging the cattle rustlers with a desecration. Is stopping livestock thieves really worth destroying all of this priceless archaeological history? Wow, eggs like these could only be laid by a giant chicken! Desert nesting bald eagles were almost extinct at the time this episode aired, with just a handful of nests scattered around the southwestern United States. Shaggy and Scooby looked ready to cook up what could have been one of the last remaining eggs from a breeding pair and potentially causing the extinction of an entire species. No wonder that bird was pissed. Ironically, at the time this episode aired, Shaggy and Scooby were more likely to be arrested for what they did with those eggs than what Farron and the rest did with the Native American burial grounds. 
It's one thing if the villains were making rudimentary mistakes while panicking, but that much cattle had to have been stolen long before the gang arrived to potentially scare Farron and his crew enough to make them get sloppy. Meaning they started out sloppy, and it would only have been a matter of time before their plot failed. As for the rebranding, it's unlikely Farron's method would work that well in practice. We see Fred easily overriding the lazy S brand with the double O, but that was on the ground. The unmoving ground that was incapable of feeling pain or remembering the last time that someone with the smoking brand got close to its rump. Cattle branding usually involves using some method of securing the animal. If done by a single ranch hand like we see in the episode, some sort of binding equipment would normally have been required to keep the steer from moving. If such equipment isn't available, at least one other person is needed to hold the animal down. In either situation, the steer is unlikely to hold still enough for the new brand to be so neatly placed over top the existing one well enough to hide it. Man, poor Scooby's backside is never going to heal. It should also be mentioned that it was dangerous as hell for Farron, and probably Carl, to herd the cattle like that while wearing the cow suit. We're talking animals that typically weigh over a half ton running in a moving wave, and it should have been impossible for two men on foot to keep up with him, let alone encumbered by what's essentially a Halloween gag costume. It was only a matter of time before the two men were trampled to death. This is also made even more obviously unnecessary by the fact that Farron's foreman openly rode his horse around the stolen livestock without disguising himself. If the villains felt comfortable enough that there weren't any witnesses around to see him, why did they bother maintaining their own cow or witch doctor disguises? <laughs> huh? -wonka, -wonka. Gotta hand it to the bad guy for staying in character. I mean, as far as he knew, he was alone as his victims just got away, and instead of taking his mask off and swearing, he does his little witch doctor dance. This is Gerald Leto levels of commitment to keeping in character, no matter how problematic the role is. It's apparent that Sam Farron's cattle rustling operation was doomed to fail at some point, but it's difficult to argue that, despite his mistakes, he still got away with an awful lot. He gets a 3 out of 5. This leaves the corrupt cattleman and his henchmen with a final due score of 2.2 out of 5. I would like to take a moment to thank my new Patreon members and apologize in advance if I mispronounce any names. Blood Beclock. Thank you, Blood Beclock. Benjamin Willis. Thank you, Benjamin Willis. Thank you to everyone helping support my channel. It absolutely means the world to me. If you'd like to help, there's a link to my Patreon page below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. New members get a personal thank you in the next regular video I upload after they join, as well as credits in each regular video for as long as they remain a member. The gang are enjoying a sunny day of water skiing until their boat runs aground after narrowly avoiding a shark attack. Oh, that looks familiar. Unfortunately for them, their shark troubles have only just begun because after making their escape from the beach where their damaged boat had landed, they find themselves in a foggy ocean research facility currently being haunted by a million-year-old demon shark. Mr. Wells, the assistant manager of the Aqualand Aquarium and Laboratory, planned to steal a valuable set of pearl jewelry being shipped to the United States from India. He was counting on using his position at the aquarium to smuggle the pearls out of state, but was inadvertently thwarted by his boss, Mr. Dreyfus. Look! We're inside Aqualand! Is it just me, or does that squid mural look quite a bit like the evil entity in the final episode of Mystery Incorporated? Deciding his best bet to complete his plan was to take over as manager, Wells dressed up as a monster to scare away Dreyfus, basing his costume on the recently unearthed remains of a frozen specimen he helped retrieve for Aqualand. Wait a minute. A villain who works for an ocean institute uses a disguise based on a real million-year-old specimen frozen in ice 
to get rid of a coworker in order to advance his scheme. Why does that sound familiar? This is essentially the same plot as Scooby's Night with a Frozen Fright from 60 years earlier, including similar moments where the gang are manhandled by aquatic creatures and Fred tries to trap the villain with a net, but instead nabs his own friends. I'd rather have Frankenstein in here than that weird humanoid shark demon. <laughs> they dredge it up out of the Indian Ocean, where it's been buried for over a million years. I know the Scooby writers weren't scientists, and this is a show meant for children, but this is still bad writing. In general, ancient animal remains are preserved in one of two ways, fossilization and being frozen in ice. Fossilization doesn't preserve tissue though, and instead gradually changes matter from organic to inorganic. It said the shark had been buried, but it had to have been in ice to remain as intact as this. Except the Indian Ocean is literally the warmest ocean on the planet and doesn't have anywhere for ice to exist like this anywhere near India. Granted, the ocean does technically reach Antarctica, which is just lousy with ice, but considering they flew the demon shark out of India, it stands to reason the remains were found near that coast. Any further south, and the demon shark likely would have been taken to Australia or an African country. Setting aside the improbability of an animal being preserved in ice in an area where there isn't any ice, the oldest frozen animal remains ever found are only around 40,000 years old. A million years is quite the stretch for our shark demon. You know, for a couple of guys from India, those two are kind of pale. Maybe they're just feeling sick from being in an airplane flying through a bad thunderstorm. I sure don't envy you fellas, flying all the way from India in the same plane with that, that thing. They dredge it up out of the Indian Ocean, where it's been buried for over a million years. Then it goes on display at Aquaworld. One trunk containing rare pearls, value two million dollars. Everybody got that? You can rest easy. Those jewels will be as safe in here as if they were locked up in Fort Knox. I'm pretty sure Fort Knox keeps at least a few guys standing guard around the place. <laughs> Who's the villain this time around? The Invisible Man? At least we know that the scheme is worth the risks involved, since the pearls were said to be valued at $2 million. That's the equivalent of over $11 million in today's money. Or was it worth the risk? Scooby Dooby Doo! Let's start eating! <laughs> That's Scooby for you! He even eats while he water skis! Well, like, uh, skiing gives you an appetite! I spent half my childhood living on a lake, and I can tell you there is no way that Shaggy would have been able to hear Velma over the sound of the boat engine or the splashing of his skis. Also, how in the hell did Shaggy and Scooby manage to start skiing while holding all that food in their hands? Usually you start while floating in the water, though I suppose they could have started from the end of a pier. Except there doesn't appear to be any piers on that beach where the mystery machine is parked. Come to think of it, there's no boat ramp either. So how did they launch their vessel from that trailer in the first place? It sure was nice of your uncle to lend us his boat, Velma. It's a beauty. Another uncle. And police are still without clues to the mysterious disappearance of $2 million worth of Indian pearls stolen from the airport customs building. This has to be the most egregious example of the coincidental broadcast trope I've ever seen. You know the trope. It's when a character just happens to turn on the TV or radio at just the right moment to hear an important bit of news that directly involves the plot. Daphne turned on the radio and a reporter immediately started discussing the pearl theft. Then she switched the unit off after the exposition was delivered. Except she didn't switch it off. Those push buttons aren't for power. They're for choosing preset radio station channels. You can clearly see this as the channel indicator moves when the switches are pushed. As is the case with any high-profile theft, 
Wells would likely not have had an easy time fencing such easily identifiable merchandise. The fact that the stolen pearls were still a big news item over a week later meant the authorities had to have been under a lot of pressure to solve the crime. Considering the pearls were stolen from another country while in U.S. custody, this was probably an international incident. In addition to local law enforcement, the FBI was probably on Wells' trail too. Even if he managed to get the pearls out of the state, it could take years until the heat died down enough to make it safe to sell the stolen merchandise. It is possible Wells already had a buyer set up beforehand because, sadly, the world is filled with shady, hypocritical rich people willing to overlook international law and their own conscience to get hold of stolen cultural treasures. As mentioned, the pearls were worth a lot of money, but of course, that's no indication of their value as a fenced good. If Wells was able to sell the pearls, he would be lucky to get even 20% of their value, which would be around $400,000, or $2.2 million in today's money. That's a lot of cash, but would it be enough for a comfortable tropical island retirement? Let's put it in perspective. Today's annual salary for an oceanographer can average around $75,000, which would be close to $14,500 in 1976. The potential $400,000 Wells might get for the stolen pearls would be equal to over 25 years of tax-free income. He looks to be a man in his late 40s or early 50s, so this does seem to be an amount that might make the scheme worthwhile. The villain's plan wasn't original, but it was profitable. However, it was also extremely risky, as Wells would have been up against the combined might of federal, state, and local law enforcement no doubt spurred on by angry politicians eager to appease an outraged foreign government. Two out of five for the design. I'm not going to spend much time complaining about how unoriginal the costumes were here. We've already seen aquatic monsters, frozen monsters, and shark monsters in the scooby doo universe. It's just annoying that two episodes in a row blatantly reused character models. Instead, I'm going to discuss just how stupid it was for Wells to pick this design. Or rather, how stupid it was that he picked this design without putting in the prerequisite effort to make it work. As mentioned, this episode borrows heavily from the one featuring the frozen caveman back in the second season of Where Are You? But there's one glaring difference between the two villains. Don't worry, Professor. We'll find him. Despite showing the demon shark's ice block dripping water several times, it never actually fully melts, and the remains stay frozen for the entirety of the episode. Wells dressed up as a monster that was able to be demonstrably shown having remained frozen and locked in a lab. It's obvious the shark demon running around the aquarium could not have been the same one that was entombed in a block of ice. Whereas with the frozen caveman, the ice block had been thawed completely, making it appear as though the prehistoric bad guy that chased the gang was the same one that had arrived at Oceanland like a bag of fish sticks. Well, that's our cue to skidoo! <laughs> I don't like turning these villain analysis videos into a free-for-all of animation mistakes and other goofs. But if there's thunder and lightning behind the demon shark in the doorway here, why isn't the lightning also in the sky above the doorway? The single positive element of Wells' outfit was that it was indeed frightening. They kept referring to the frozen remains as a demon shark, which is fine because, frankly, all sharks are demon sharks. Especially that guy. You know evolution had a hell of a time with your looks when your entire species is named after goblins. Almost any other reused character model would have resulted in the lowest costume score possible. But credit where credit is due, at least it was one of the scarier designs. Two out of five for the outfit. Before breaking down Wells' scheme, give me a moment for a brief tangent. Jeepers, it looks like we're stuck on this beach. And like we'll never get up that cliff. Maybe we can make it. All we need is our anchor, our ski rope, and a little good old Yankee ingenuity. Ha! <laughs> 
How in the f did they get that anchor up there? They couldn't have thrown it like a grappling hook. An anchor that size would likely weigh anywhere from 50 to 100 pounds. That's not even including the weight of the rope attached to it. This is another moment that mirrors one from the Frozen Caveman episode when the villain in that one tossed around an even larger anchor like it weighed nothing. Also, that is not the right sized anchor for a boat this small, because not only would it be overkill, there wasn't enough room on the vessel to store it. And why would the gang have even brought an anchor in the first place when they were going skiing and not swimming or fishing where there would actually be a need for it? Now that I think about it, why in the hell weren't they wearing swimsuits? Even if Fred, Daphne, and Velma weren't planning on getting wet, Shaggy certainly was. You don't go into the water wearing street clothes and shoes because not only will they get soaked, but it's dangerous trying to swim dressed like that because regular clothes get heavy and make it difficult to move. Speaking of things that aren't safe, none of the gang were wearing any life jackets. Between this and habitually not wearing seatbelts, early Scooby-Doo was a terrible show when it comes to teaching basic safety precautions. But it's so foggy, I, I can't see a thing. Come on, we need to find a phone to call for help. They borrowed the boat from Velma's uncle. If it's this late in the evening and they haven't returned, surely he would have become worried and called the Coast Guard by now. Don't call me Shirley. Back to the villain. After helping secure the frozen demon shark in India, Wells arranged to have the remains transported to the United States on the same airplane that would be carrying the valuable shipment of pearl jewelry he intended to steal. Using his knowledge of carpentry, Wells rigged a false bottom on the base supporting the massive ice block containing the demon shark. This gave him a spot to hide during the trip so that when the demon shark and the pearls were left unguarded in a custom storeroom, he was able to safely steal the latter after which he returned to the hidden compartment until the demon shark was delivered to Aqualand. What must this have been like for Wells? He was stuck in a cramped storage compartment for any number of hours waiting for the demon shark to be loaded onto the plane, another likely 20 hours of flight time, and then an additional 24 hours until the demon shark was released by customs. I wonder what he ate before getting inside, because if his last meal beforehand was Indian food, he should have crawled out of that compartment looking and smelling like Chet from Weird Science. At least that's what would have happened to me, considering what Vindaloo can do to my digestive system. Once back at Aqualand, Wells hid the stolen pearls in plain sight by stuffing them inside dozens of frozen oysters alongside hundreds of living ones in an aquarium tank, with the intention of later having them shipped to another branch of Aqualand in Florida. This would have successfully smuggled the contraband out of the state, avoiding the watchful eyes of law enforcement. Every step of Wells' plan had his fingerprints on them, and I'm not just speaking figuratively as we see him using his bare hands to handle the case that held the pearl jewelry. If his name came up at any point during the eventual investigation, Wells would be easily linked to the crime. Look, M. Dreyfus, manager. Hey, there's a light on. He must be working late. Maybe he can answer a few questions about that demon shark. Side characters in the scooby doo universe often have names that are puns based on their occupation or references to pop culture. Jaws came out the year before this episode aired, and it featured an oceanographer named Matt Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfus. Is it possible the M stands for Matt, and even though it's not spelled the same, could Dreyfus be referring to the actor? I have reason to believe that Professor Beaker, our biologist, brought it back to life. Mr. Wells, my assistant, told me Beaker has a book of spells, ancient Hindu spells, that can revive the dead. To divert suspicion, Wells lied to his boss, Dreyfus, that one of Aqualand's researchers, Professor Beaker, had a book of magic spells with which he used to resurrect the shark demon. Just how dumb was Dreyfus that he took Wells at his word? Was Dreyfus missing at the unmasking at the end of the episode because he was too ashamed to look Beaker in the eye after blaming him for the demon shark? Can you imagine the poor guy in HR who had to deal with the fallout the next day? 
Hmm. Thank you for seeing me, Mr. Dreyfus. We received a complaint from another employee that you... accused him of terrorizing the aquarium staff by using magic to resurrect the corpse of a million-year-old aquatic animal? Care to explain yourself? It just so happens we've got the spell book right at... Yeah! What you found is a cookbook. Cookbook? It's, it's a cookbook. Or are magic spells something oceanographers routinely use? To be fair, if they run into things like this in the course of their work, they might at least want a working understanding of exorcisms. Maybe even have a talisman in their back pocket. Ever since it arrived here last week from India, the creature has been right in this room. Right here. It hasn't moved a muscle in over a, a million years. Even though Professor Beaker was innocent, he's plainly a lousy researcher. You do not leave precious paleontological remains in an open, unrefrigerated area like this. The demon shark should have been stored in an airtight, climate-controlled room. The sample was already in danger of being hopelessly contaminated. Like, wow, that was some ride. The gang were just dragged through a swimming pool by dolphins, and yet they're all bone dry. I guess they didn't need to wear swimsuits earlier after all. So long and thanks for all the fish. Well, there's nothing to worry about as long as the demon shark is safely on ice in the professor's laboratory. Yeah, I guess Daphne's right. But the five of you clearly saw it running around the aquarium. It literally chased you into a swimming pool. You know there's a monster on the loose. Stop gaslighting yourself, Shaggy. Of course, the real significance here is that since the frozen demon shark was still in its spot in the lab, it was obvious that whatever was chasing them was just another guy in a suit. Fred should have busted out the trap the moment they got to Aqualand and saw the block of ice was still solid. What about the book of spells Mr. Dreyfus said you had? Mr. Wells, the assistant manager, showed it to me once. Uh, but I haven't seen it in months. We've talked to the professor and Dreyfus, and someone isn't telling the truth. Actually, Fred, neither Dreyfus nor Beaker are the villains, so neither one is lying. The writers should have had this line come after the gang met Wells, and he told them about having seen Beaker with the book of magic spells. A secret drawer. Yes. Cabinet work is my hobby. Is it really a secret drawer when anyone can bump it open by accidentally tapping it with their elbow? Showing Wells' expertise with carpentry is meant to foreshadow his use of the hidden compartment under the Demon Shark ice block later on during the reveal. But let's give that compartment some scrutiny. In another example of the Scooby writers not appreciating basic physics, they greatly underestimated the weight of the Demon Shark ice block. Unfortunately, I'm once again going to have to use a lot of guesswork when it comes to the following figures. But I'm confident enough that even if my estimations are a bit off, it won't matter with the overall point I'm about to make. I estimate the ice block is around 8 feet long by 4 feet wide by 4 feet tall, giving it a volume of 128 cubic feet. Water weighs around 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. That would put the weight of the ice block at just under 8,000 pounds, or 4 tons. While this doesn't take into account any hollow cavities inside the body of the demon shark, it's fair to assume the rest of it would likely weigh more than water anyway, offsetting the difference. If the wooden base under the ice block was solid throughout, it would likely be able to support that much weight. However, Wells made it hollow to create a hiding spot for himself. We don't even have to guess the size of the compartment because the animators goofed up at the beginning of the episode and showed us the empty compartment with the door off the hinge. 
it would appear the base is comprised of thin boards that are unlikely to be more than two inches thick. Physics and math are not my forte, but I don't think it's going out on a limb to say there is no way in hell that base built by Wells would support the weight of the Demon Shark ice block. Even if it managed to stay intact long enough for the villain to crawl inside, it wouldn't be long until one of the boards collapsed and Wells ended up looking like the bottom of a bucket of crushed wine grapes. If nothing else, that cart with those tiny wheels could not have supported the ice block. Let's revisit one of the other aspects of Wells' plan. But Wells used this costume to pose as the demon shark to make it seem that it had been brought back to life. Because he wanted to scare Dreyfus, the manager, off the job. Wells had hidden the pearls inside some frozen oysters from Sam's fish market, intending to ship them out of the state to another aqua land in Florida. But like Mr. Dreyfus wouldn't permit the shipment, so he tried to scare him away with the demon shark costume. Despite his goal of running off the manager of Aqualand so he could take over the position, Wells spent the entire time he was dressed as the Demon Shark in this episode chasing the gang, not Dreyfus. In fact, Dreyfus didn't seem worried or show the slightest bit of concern over his own safety. If he had, it would be unlikely he would stay in the deserted aquarium so late at night. Wells failed miserably at this part of his plan. It's the famous Aqualand Pie-in-the-Sky Revolving Restaurant. Pie-in-the-Sky? And we'll search for the spell book up there. Yeah. You think maybe that book of spells could be hidden inside one of those pies, Scoob? Shaggy and Scooby are stealing the restaurant's pies. This is a crime and one they're guilty of repeatedly throughout every series and most films. Do you suppose Fred and the rest can afford to drive all over the country solving mysteries for free because Shaggy and Scooby supplement a large portion of their eating expenses by theft? Like, hey, what's happening? Isn't it a little dangerous for a revolving restaurant to have a fast setting like that? Can you imagine the lawsuits after dozens of diners are injured by being violently tossed out of their seats in the middle of brunch because a bored dishwasher messed with the gear switch? If Wells had spent more time chasing Dreyfus, he could have become the manager by now and simply kicked the gang out of the aquarium instead of chasing them in his demon shark disguise. In fact, why didn't he just kick them out? They were trespassing after hours, and Wells was the assistant manager. He may not have had the authority to authorize animal transfers between Aqualand locations, but surely he had the authority to evict a group of meddling kids who weren't supposed to be there. Stop calling me Shirley. Look! Secret spells of gastronomy! <laughs> we found it, Scoob! We found the spell book! Look! The crabs grabbed the spell book! Luckily, I took scuba diving lessons. Yes, yes, we already know you guys know how to scuba dive. Or do we? All right, Shaggy, now what was it you just remembered? That I can't swim! <laughs> It's tempting to fault Wells for chasing Shaggy and Scooby into the revolving restaurant, considering that was where Shaggy found the cookbook, which he mistook for a spell book. If that had not happened, the crab would not have snagged the book and dived into the aquarium tank where the gang found all the oysters. We can set aside this mistake of Wells, though, because come on. It's a restaurant. There's no way Shaggy and Scooby weren't going to find themselves there at some point. It's also tempting to fault Wells for inventing the idea of the spellbook in the first place. Not only was it a ridiculous concept that should not have even been considered remotely plausible by Dreyfus the manager or Beaker the researcher, but the supposed existence of the book is also what prompted the gang to spend their time searching the aquarium in the first place, which again led to the discovery of the oysters. No. This is what we should fault Wells for. Say. I wonder what's under that tarp. 
that strange? There's nothing but empty oyster crates from Sam's Fish Market. Wells should not have kept the empty oyster crates. For starters, the robbery occurred over a week ago, meaning these empty, smelly boxes have been lying around the professor's lab all that time. Which begs the question, why didn't Beaker discard them? Or at the very least, protest that his workspace was being used for storing garbage. Those crates that Wells kept around for whatever reason, coupled with the unapproved transfer order found in Dreyfus's office, kept oysters in the front of Fred and Velma's minds, allowing them to make the connection after seeing Shaggy pull a bunch of them out of the tank. The only reason I could come up with for why Wells kept the empty oyster crates was to perhaps reuse them when the time came to ship the oysters to the Florida Aqualand. Except I can't help but think it would be an extremely bad look for a respected aquarium to be seen moving specimens in commercial food packaging. Not to mention the crates were meant to transfer frozen food and weren't built to hold live animals that required seawater. This inexplicable mistake was the linchpin of failure for Wells' scheme, and led directly to his capture. That would have been bad enough, but thinking back to how incredibly dangerous it was for him to be hiding in rickety furniture under four tons of ice, I can't help but give him an operation score of 1.5 out of 5. Wells was lucky to be alive. The Demon Shark of Aqualand gets a final do score of 1.8 out of 5. Lower Scooby down, Shaggy! Oops. Again, this is why you do not let untrained operators handle dangerous heavy machinery. And that's my ranking of the villains from the sixth set of episodes of the first season of the Scooby-Doo Show, shown here along with the ones from my previous videos. Again, we have a couple of low rankers, and I'm beginning to worry if those watching my videos are starting to suspect I may have a personal bias against this series, or am otherwise looking for reasons to give such low scores to the villains. It's actually the opposite. I try to give them all the benefit of the doubt and look for things that would bump their scores up. When scoring the individual sections, they all start out with a 5 before I start deducting points for the negative elements while adding points back for the positive ones. Of course, not all negatives are created equally. If, for example, you crawl under a four-ton block of ice under the assumption you're going to be perfectly safe because you assume a two-inch thick wooden board is adequate to support the weight, you're losing a lot of points. I hope to see you next time. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If you'd like to help support this channel, there's a link to my Patreon below, but please only join if you're comfortable doing so. Patreon members receive credit in my videos for as long as they remain a member, as well as a personal shout out in the next regular video produced after they join. I'm claustrophobic, and the more I considered how long Wells spent in that sweaty, cramped compartment with the combined weight of eight steers pressing down on him. I went through some changes.